In this presentation, I will talk about the Russian language itself, uh, uh, the backbone of Russian, uh, as it were. So, uh, how, how do we study the Russian language? Uh, so what I'm going to talk about here is what do you need to learn to be able to speak and understand Russian? And I'm not going to talk about vocabulary or that sort of thing. I'm going to talk about grammar because grammar is important when you learn Russian. And uh, the things you need to learn to be able to use Russian are in many ways also the things that makes Russian interesting as a language if you go on to study it uh, in its own right. And uh, when we look at it, we may, may also start wondering why it is the way it is. So what, what is this backbone? Well, I would say uh, in any language, the backbone is nouns and verbs. Uh, the only, uh, so nouns and verbs are the only categories that are universal, so every language will have nouns and ver verbs, but there is no guarantee that they're going to have things like adjectives or prepositions uh, or lots of other familiar categories. Uh, nouns and verbs also happen to, the category, to be the categories where Russian and English differ the most in their organization. So if we look at uh, nouns, and uh, something most people know about Russian is that Russian has case. So case is... Uh, morphological marking on nouns and adjectives and pronouns that marks the participants in the sentence, the players, if you like. So if we want to say something as simple as Lisa is reading a book or Lisa is reading the book, then in Russian, you uh, have to mark the person who reads Lisa with the nominative and uh, the thing that's being read, the object with the accusative so that you get Lisa chitait knigu. Um, so the subject is marked, the object is marked. So if we turn the sentence around uh, and say knigu chitait Lisa, uh, then it means the same. Lisa is reading the book. So it doesn't affect who is doing what to whom. And Russian doesn't stop there. It can mark a whole range of different types of roles in a sentence. So, for instance, if we want to say Lisa wrote a note for Lena in pencil, you can say Lisa napisala zapisku lini karandashon. So we have the nominative marking the person who does the writing, and then we have the accusative marking the thing that was written. Now we have the dative marking Liana because she is the recipient. And finally, we have uh, the instrumental case marking, you guessed it, the instrument, the pencil that she's writing the note with. So it's fully encoded in Russian. And uh, of course, this also means that you will have to learn all these forms for all nouns, adjectives, pronouns, etc. So this isn't what things are like in English. In English, uh, syntactic roles are marked by word order. Uh, for instance, usually the sub subject is going to immediately precede the main verb and the object is going to immediately follow it. So if we say Lisa is reading the book, then the subject and object are encoded in English as well. And we can see this if we try to move things around. So if we uh, turn this around and say the book is reading Lisa, well, actually English grammar forces us to interpret the book as the subject of the sentence. So of course this clashes with everything we know about books and reading and people. Uh, so we will find this sentence unreasonable, but uh, the word order does push us to make this sort of interpretation. But in Russian, the word order does no such thing. It's free to do other things. So what, what does the word order in Russian go ahead and do? Well, it does something that we might call information packaging. So in Russian, you get old information first and new information last. Uh, we actually do this in English as well. So if we want to, if we're talking about man, uh, we've been saying things about him, where, where he's from, what he was doing, uh, uh, how he went, for instance, to India. Uh, we've been talking about him. Well, then we want to relate the uh, fact that he was shockingly killed by a tiger. Uh, then the man is the old information and the uh, fact that he was killed by a tiger is the new information we want to convey about this man, right? And we see that the man is naturally put first 
in English, but we also see that we have to uh, use the passive to achieve this in English. Whereas in Russian, we can just turn the sentence around. We can say uh, So the word for man is marked with the accusative and the word for tiger is in the nominative. So there is no doubt at all who killed whom, right? So we achieve uh, new informa old information before new information simply by changing the word order. So a couple of things follow from this in Russian. So one thing is that Russian uses much less passive than English because it doesn't need to. Uh, it does have a passive, it does use it for some things, but uh, much less than English. And another observation we can make is that Russian doesn't have a definite article uh, because uh, the definite article marks old information as well, and Russian uses word order to convey that sort of information. So let's turn to the verbs, the action, not just the participants. So in English, you know, verbs are verbs. You have verbs like read, you have verbs like write, kill, and since we're, we're on a killing spree here, so, so sorry, it will, there will be more killing. Uh, whereas in Russian, verbs typically come in pairs and those pairs are a spectral pairs. So Russian verbs have verbal aspect. So instead of having just one verb read, there are two. There is chitet, which is in perfective aspect, and parachitet, which is a perfective aspect. And the same for write, you have pisat and napisat, and the same for kill, ubivait, ubit. So in every sentence, you basically have to choose. You can't just pick a verb. You have to make up your mind whether your verb is going to be perfective or imperfective. So if you choose the perfective verb, you will see the event, uh, for instance, if you well, say your reading event as a whole. So if you use a perfective uh, it means you finished whatever you were reading and we're telling you the whole uh, event. Uh, whereas if you choose the imperfective, the event is either ongoing or it could be repeated or it could be just static. So uh, for instance, um, back to the, 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 the tiger example, uh, so if we is, choose a perfective verb and say tiger ubil mushino, the tiger killed the man, then we're telling the story in full. Uh, the, the killing event is brought to an end and you, we're relating the whole event to you. Whereas if we pick the imperfective, ubivat, and then we get a different meaning. So if we have exactly the same sentence, but only change the aspect, so we get tiger ubival ubival mushino, uh, then it has to be an ongoing event. So you come into the event at the point where the tiger was killing the man, but we don't get to see it to the end in this sentence. Uh, uh, and another possible interpretation, uh, not in this sentence, but uh, in, in the next example is something like tiger inagda ubival gyudye. The tiger sometimes killed people also with the imperfective ubivait. So verbs form pairs, uh, and there are actually more than, there's, there's more than one way to do this. So the perfective partner can be a prefix version of the imperfective partner. So we've seen that so far, right? So if we have read chitat, we can add the prefix pro, which uh, generally means something like through, and get prachitat, so something like through read. Uh, and if we have write, we can add na, uh, napisat on right, right. Um, but if we look at ubit, it the perfective partner seems to be a prefix version of some other imperfective verb, not ubivait that we've seen, right? So actually, that verb is beat, which means to beat. Uh, so you add u to to beat, and then you arrive at kill, but literally away beat. So the thing here is that the prefix changes the meaning of the verb so much that it's going to need a new imperfective partner. So ubit forms its own imperfective partner by adding the suffix va. So you go from ubit to ubivat to kill. So if we want wanted to make uh, perfective partners for verb, we could imagine that there would be some prefixes that just mean uh, I'm perfecter. Uh, and then we could imagine that there would be other prefixes that meant, you know, out and uh, away and on and through and whatever. 
but as a matter of fact, they're the same prefixes with the same meaning. So you use the very same prefixes to form perfective partners and to change the meaning of simple verbs. So for instance, let's have a look at the prefix ras. So one of the meanings it has is something like swell. So if we have the verb duj, which means to blow, and we add the ras, then it takes on the meaning inflate, because when you uh, inflate something, you blow so that something swells, right? So the prefix adds a meaning which the base verb doesn't already have and changes it. And this new verb is going to need a new partner. And the new partner is actually a rasduvite. So it's made like ubivite that we saw earlier, okay? Um, so what's the perfective partner of the imperfective verb tuchnut then that actually means to swell? Well, it's the rasbuchnut. So you have a verb that means swell and then you add a prefix that also uh, means swell. So basically, the perfectivizing prefix matches the verb semantically. The meaning of the prefix and the base verb overlap. So the choice of prefix when you form perfective verbs uh, is not random. It's semantically motivated. So given all this, what kind of a language is Russian? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's got a complex but very, very nuanced verb system. So you can do so much with it. Uh, and it carefully marks the role of every participant in the sentence. So you always know who is doing what to whom. And it's got very flexible word order that can be used to great effect. So that if you want to you know, know and use Russian, you will have to uh, learn to appreciate and master these aspects of Russian. Otherwise, it won't give up its secrets and treasures to you. Uh, and of course, if we study, uh, if you go on with Russian and keep studying it uh, in its own right, these are exactly the sorts of things we're interested in as well. So if you go on uh, taking one of the specialized uh, linguistics papers, then, then you would still be looking at this sort of thing. Uh, finally, we might ask how it got like this. And I'm going to show you very briefly a, a little postcard from the past. Uh, so this is a, a birch bark letter. It's scraped into a piece of birch bark uh, by a boy named Onfim, uh, who was about seven years when he wrote this. Uh, uh, and this was in Novgorod in the early 13th century. Uh, so he's written, so he's, there's a portrait of him where he's riding on a horse and defeating an enemy, sort of auto portrait. And then uh, his name is written there. So Onfime here, O-N-F-E-M-E, -E uh, in a sort of early Cyrillic. And at the top here is actually the alphabet, A, B, V, G, D, and so on. So it's clear that uh, Onfim, uh, the little boy that he was, was being taught how to write. Uh, which bears witness to the unprecedented literacy of Novgorod uh, in the Middle Ages. Uh, so one thing, if you go on uh, with Russian, you can do is, is, is to study the history of Russian. That's one of the option papers you will have later uh, and see how it became like this. You could also study uh, Old Church Slavonic, which is uh, the Latin of the Slavonic languages, or you could do comparative Slavonic philology uh, to look into how all, how Russian relates to the other Slavonic languages, several of which you can also study in this degree.